Well, good morning. Stand to your feet and worship with us. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever, sing praise, sing praise, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever, for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. Sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us, forever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever.
I got the men come forward for the offering this morning. Uh, just want to take a few moments and uh, thank everyone that came out Friday night and, and everybody that helped uh, bring a dessert, help set up, and, and all the things that went into uh, making our fundraiser a, a success. We had over 200 people here uh, Friday night and uh, just had a great time. Kids had a great time playing on the bounce houses. Uh, we had more food than we could eat and we auctioned some of that off at the end and and uh, some lucky people got to go home with that and uh, and uh, we just had a, a good time. We're, we're still working on the totals. We've got a few more um, donations coming in. So next week we're going to be sharing with you uh, kind of the final numbers on that, let you know how, how things went. But we just want to thank you uh, for your continued support in, in the mission to reach the next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's really about. Um, we, we want them to have a strong, solid education, but most of all, we want them to know Jesus. And so I just thank you for your support in that. Uh, a couple more announcements. Uh, this Wednesday at 6 p.m. we have our Warriors of the Word. Uh, that is for kindergarten through fifth grade uh, in the gymnasium. We also have a nursery uh, that evening as well as Wednesday night Bible study at 6 p.m. here in the sanctuary. Uh, Pastor Troy is going through a study entitled Basic Christianity, looking at some very basic practical things that, that we do every day and, and how the Bible applies to those things. Uh, coming up on October 21st, we have a men's and boys shoot them up. Um, there's details on the church website. You can see the details on the app. If you've got any questions, please reach out to Pastor Roger, and he'd be happy to give you some details. Uh, and the next big thing that we have coming up is the Hullabaloo. Uh, the Hullabaloo is an event that we do every uh, year uh, around October 31st uh, to provide uh, a way to reach out to the community, serve the community, give them a safe place for their kids to go and, and get candy so they don't have to go door to door and provide bounce houses and some fun things, and also opportunities for us to um, share the gospel with those that we communicate with at night, invite them to church, and, uh, and let them know that we love them and that we're here uh, to support them. Uh, Hello Blue, you can find information on that uh, coming out this week. We'll have sign-ups uh, coming uh, pretty soon for that, so I would encourage you to uh, be on the lookout for that uh, and uh, sign up for a spot when you see that. And then we'll also be taking uh, candy donations, and we'll have a box out in the foyer for that. It takes a lot of candy that we hand out that night. And so if you could just pick up a, a large bag of a sort of candy and, and drop it in the box uh, here in the weeks to come before uh, that October 31st date, uh, it'd be much appreciated. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the many blessings that you give us, uh, the provision that, that you give faithfully, that no matter whether we're doing the right things or, or the wrong things or whether our life seems to be going good for us or bad for us, you're always there. You're always constant. You provide and you never waver. Father, as we dive into your word this morning, we just ask that you would open our minds and our hearts that, would, that we would see that reality. that we would be anchored in, in who you are and find true rest, find true peace. Father, we give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's good to be with you this morning. This morning we're going to be in the book of Hebrews, uh, specifically in chapter 6, looking at one specific verse, verse 19. Uh, in verse 19 it says this, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as the forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As I began to think about what I was going to preach this week and uh, examine different texts, uh, I had different ideas come to mind and, and different things that... Uh, I thought would be good to communicate, and, and a lot of times as I kind of prepare a message, a lot of it's built around the things that I've been thinking on and examining and studying, and of late, I've, I've, I've taken a lot of time to think about just the state of the world, uh, just the state that things that are in, and the things that we hear on, whether it be the news, whether it be TV, whether it be on our social media, um, the radio, what we read, uh, there, there's a lot of information that we take in every day. Uh, a lot of information that influences the way that we perceive how things are. And it's interesting, it's always interesting to see how different people answer questions about the state of the United States or specific political candidates or specific individuals. and, and in how sometimes those perceptions of the same thing can be so different. And as I thought through this and, and, and thought through some texts of, of where we're going today, um, I want to encourage us to, to really begin to practice and, and work on our discernment. It, it's very easy to get swayed into thinking a certain way just by what you passively take in. The influences around you, who you hang out with, the way that you talk, the people around you, how they talk, the things that you listen to on the radio, things that you watch on TV, all those things influence how you see and perceive things, whether we really recognize it or not. In my Sunday school class this morning, we're working through uh, ways to study scripture and this morning's lesson was really just about the biases that we bring as we study God's word. Whether it's a cultural bias and, and, and uh, something that we grew up kind of in that influences the way that we read the Bible. Maybe it's a personal experience that brings a bias. Maybe it was a bad experience that influences the way that we look at certain situations. Maybe it's a theological bias that we bring, something that we maybe grew up being taught for a long time, and, and maybe it's right, maybe it's not right, but we allow that to kind of shape the way that we think about what we study and what we read. And, and what we're going to do today is, is look at the author of Hebrews kind of laying out the same kind of argument, the same line of thinking to his readers. Perception and, and discernment and maturity, they all kind of go together. I was uh, down at Wheatland a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's where my parents live, my grandparents live. We got some land down there. And uh, when I was in junior high and high school, I, was, I did not miss deer season. I was there. Uh, we have a little cabin that we built uh, on our land down there. We'd stay there for the weekend, go hunting, and, and have a good time. And I have a lot of good stories from that, and uh, when I went to college, they kind of stopped. I didn't have time to go hunting and, and didn't have time to do those things, and, and now that Cash is kind of getting older and, and, and coming of age where he wants to go hunting, we're, we're talking about going hunting, so we went down there to, to kind of scope out some areas where we might want to put a stand up, whether we want to put a blind or, or what we wanted to do, and kind of took him down to the cabin, let him see that, and I began to think back on all the experiences that I had. Uh, in that hunting cabin and, and, and sitting in the woods or sitting on the edge of a tree line looking out over a field and, and thinking about what it might be like for Cash on his first time to go deer hunting. And it reminded me of my first time. Uh, I went with my dad. It was early morning. Uh, the sun wasn't up yet. 
and uh, we sat down in a tree line, and, and, and we're watching out over this field. It's a big field, and it's dark. You can't really see things. You can't really make things out. Um, I was probably about seven or eight years old, um, and I was excited. Uh, a lot of anticipation, a lot of uh, things that I didn't understand, didn't really know, and I was just there for the ride. We had a, a 30-30 that I was going to shoot, and, and I was holding it, and I was sitting kind of in front of my dad, and we were just sitting on the ground in this tree line watching out over the field. And as we were watching over the field, um, and, and the light began to slowly come up, the sun began to slowly come up, I began to see something off in the distance. And I didn't know what it was. And so I, I focused in on that, and I was watching it because it didn't belong there. Wasn't really sure what it was, but I knew that it didn't belong there. I was watching it intently, and I kept saying to my dad, hey, there's something over there. I whispered to him, there's something over there. And, and, and as the sun continued to go up, I began to get nervous because it, it appeared that that thing was getting closer. And I'm like nudging my dad, hey, it's getting closer. I don't know, it's not a deer, it's big, I don't know. And, and I'm watching this, and the sun's coming up, and I'm like, I'm getting nervous. Because I don't know what this thing is, but it's bigger than me, and it seems to be getting closer to us. And I'm watching it, and I, I'm holding the scope up. I'm like, just let me shoot it. It's getting too close. I'm getting scared at this point, because I don't know what it is. And he calmed me down. He's like, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's nothing, you know. Focus on finding deer. And so time goes on, and, I, and I'm watching this thing. Scared to death that this some animal is going to come up, and I don't know what it's going to do. It, it was weird looking. Uh, it was scary looking. Uh, and I couldn't make it out. And so time goes on, and, and the sun comes up, and gets light enough where you can kind of see. And it was a big bushel of weeds. With some large leaves on it that in the dark looked pretty scary, but in the light it was nothing. It didn't move. It was just grass. But at my young age, I couldn't discern what it was that I saw. I lacked the maturity and the understanding to reason within myself that it was nothing. I didn't have the knowledge and the experience to recognize that whatever it was, it wasn't going to hurt me. And it was probably nothing all along. But as a kid, my imagination just went wild. I began to think about scary movies that I had watched, the monsters that, that creep in the night. And I began to create in my perception something that wasn't there. The writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to a people to communicate to them the supremacy of Christ. He's writing to demonstrate to them how Jesus is greater than all the things that God had done thus far. At the beginning of Hebrews, he lays out that there was a time that God spoke to his people through prophets in various ways, but now he has spoken through his son. That Jesus is the supreme revelation of who God is. That Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than Abraham. That the temple that Jesus serves in is greater than the temple that they tabernacled in. Greater than the temple that Solomon built. That the sacrifice of Jesus was greater than the sacrifice of the animals that the Israelites would bring. 
the writer of the book of Hebrews goes to a great extent to, to demonstrate how great Jesus is and how sure the hope that we have in him is over what God had already done. And as we find ourselves in the passage that we're going to look at this morning, he is calling his readers to discernment and to growth and maturity. A little bit before we get to our passage in chapter 6, verse 19, towards the end of chapter 5, he begins to warn his readers. Prior to this, he's laid out how Jesus is supreme to what God had done thus far in their history and how Jesus completes those things. And he points them back to what God had done and what God had demonstrated to them and then uses that to point back to Christ and and how much more important it is to follow Christ and to submit to him. And he begins to warn them about what happened to the Israelites who fell away. The ones who were rescued out of Egypt. Who had seen God do many miraculous things. They had seen it with their own eyes. They had seen the plagues. They had seen God part the sea. They had seen Moses lead the people. They had seen God provide the manna. They had seen the pillar of fire lead them by night. They had seen God do many, many miraculous things. But yet we know that there was a generation that fell away in the desert. They turned from God. They turned back to Egypt. They turned back to the things that they had done before God had redeemed them. And so the author of the book of Hebrews begins to point back to that and warn his readers about the dangers that are there. The dangers of falling away. In chapter 5 verse 11 it says, About this we have much to say that it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you have ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice of, to distinguish good from evil. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. What the writer is, is trying to convey to his readers is that the things that he is explaining to them, they ought to know already. They ought to understand. But yet they don't. And, and the reason they don't understand these things is because They have lived on milk. They're unskilled in the word of righteousness. They don't really know the word of God as they should. And he points them to the reality that it's solid food for the mature, that those have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. He's pointing them to maturity. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. It's good that you recognize Jesus. It's good that you have come to the faith, but now you need to grow. You need to get better. You need to mature. You need to move past the simple things. You need to move past the milk. You need to practice your powers of discernment, and you need to train those powers of discernment through the practice of distinguishing good from evil. And the way that we're able to distinguish good from evil is through our study of God's word. It's that process of sanctification. It's what Jesus prayed about in John 17 as he's praying to the Father. And he he asked the Father that those who would come and follow after him, the disciples, and those who would follow the disciples, that they would be sanctified, that they would be set apart, they would be made holy as he is holy. And that sanctification was to take place in the truth, and Jesus says, your word is truth. It's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewal of our minds, so that by testing, we may discern what is good, what is, what is good and pleasing to the will of God. 
that wrapped up in this maturity that the author is calling his readers to is this idea that they need to know the word of God. They need to be dedicated to understanding it and growing in their knowledge of it so that they can test right from wrong, good from evil, so that they can discern what is real and what is fake, that they would mature in their Christian walk. As I grew older and continued to hunt, I... I, I got to an age where I no longer needed my father to go with me. When I got into high school, I was able just to go out on my own. And I would go sit in the deer stand for hours on end. From early, early in the morning to late in the day after the sun would go down. And and the things that I didn't understand the first time I went hunting... I then understood, because I'd learned more about the environment that I was operating in. I learned how to reason and how to make sense of the things that were before me to to recognize that some things in my imagination aren't real. And I have no need to fear those things. As, As we grow in maturity in Christ, as we grow in our understanding of God's word, our discernment is sharpened and we're better able to weigh what is real and what is not. Which leads us into the text that we're going to look at this morning. The verse that we're looking at this morning is is verse 19 that it says that we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. What is this anchor of the soul? What is this hope? Why why is this important? I think first we, we have to look at what is the soul? What is the soul? Is it a spiritual thing? Is it a mental thing? Is it an intellectual thing? What, what is it? The soul is all of that. It's, it's who you truly are. It's your inner self, the, the, the one that you have the conversations with in your head that nobody else hears. That as, as in the deep recesses of your mind, as you think through things and you process things, that's part of your soul. That's who you are. How you think, how you act, the emotions that you feel. All those things are wrapped up in the soul. But the question is, why does the soul need an anchor? What, what is he trying to convey to his readers? If you put ourselves in in their context, they're struggling with a lot of things intellectually, mentally, spiritually. What what do we do with the Old Testament? What do we do with what God has already done? Where does Jesus fit into all of this? So they have questions that are going through their mind as they're trying to make sense of who Jesus is and how it all connects to what God has already done. And so the author is is laying out these things so that they can understand it and and make sense of it. But there's still this internal struggle that they're weighing through, this struggle of belief and and, and trust in who Jesus is. To add to that, we know that not only were they dealing with internal struggles, but they were probably most likely dealing with external struggles. Voices from the outside telling them different opinions and different ideas of who Jesus was. Different opinions and different ideas of where the Old Testament law fit into things. As we see in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is dealing swiftly and and very aggressively with individuals who had come into the church who were known as Judaizers, who were trying to convince the Christians that they needed to become Jews first before they could be a true Christian. That they needed to be circumcised if they weren't circumcised. That they needed to follow the feasts and the holy days in order to be true Christians. 
that struggle was probably present with those who would read the book of Hebrews, that this, this struggle of what do we do with all this? How do we put this all together? Other struggles that we know were going on that day are the struggles of persecution, whether it be from Jewish leaders or from the Roman Empire. And so you have all these things going on around them, but also you have this, this struggle within their minds of trying to navigate the storm of all this information. And so the author inserts this analogy of an anchor. When, when a ship is at sea and there's a, there's a bad storm, they need to put an anchor down so that they're not carried away to a place that they don't want, want to go by the storm. They need to secure their vessel as, as best as they can. They need to get close to land and to put that anchor down so that their ship does not get destroyed by being tossed around the ocean. You know, sometimes the, we can get bombarded with lots of information. It's really easy today. It doesn't take much to get overloaded. You turn on your phone, scroll through Facebook, scroll through Instagram, whatever your app and, and, and network of choice is. It's easy to be inundated with things. I find myself sometimes going on Facebook or YouTube and just swiping through the reels, the short video clips, like 10 seconds. Some of them are hilarious. I mean, I just have a good laugh sometimes and send them to Katie and she's in the other room and I'm in, you know, that's just how we communicate now through funny videos. But as I cycle through that, I'm inundated with information. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's dangerous. All that information that we take in, it's like a storm sometimes. We don't know where to land. We don't know where to make sense of things. What is real? What is reality. Depending on who you talk to, you get thousands of answers. Without an anchor, without something securing us in who we are, we get tossed to and fro from one idea to another. In fact, that's what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Through 14, he says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes." Paul gives that analogy of the ship being tossed to and fro by the waves of the storm. And, and the one who is not growing in maturity, the one who is not strengthening that tether to the anchor, will be tossed to and fro. Will be told one thing and go one direction, and they'll be told another thing and go the other direction. They, could, they will never be able to land they will be able to find peace or rest or surety in the situations that they're in. They won't have hope. They'll just constantly be struggling. What is this anchor? What is this thing that tethers us to reality? What is this thing that tethers us in the storm that, that gives us this hope? In verse 17 of chapter 6, it says, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner place behind the curtain. What is the hope? What is the anchor? That anchor of our soul is the hope. So what is the hope 
that we have. The hope that we have is found in the promise and the oath of God. And that promise and oath of God is guaranteed by God himself, something that cannot change. And it's all wrapped up in what God has showed us, what God has revealed to us through his divine revelation, through his word. And we see that at the beginning of this chapter, a little bit further ahead in in verse 13, the author lays out the context that he's pointing back to, where God showed his unchangeable character, where God demonstrated his promise, where God demonstrated his oath. It says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you, and thus Abraham Abraham having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is a final confirmation. So when God desired to show, when God desired to reveal more convincingly to the heirs of promise, to Abraham and his offspring, when he chose to reveal that promise, the unchangeable purpose of his character of his purpose, he guaranteed that promise with an oath. The author says it's, it's impossible for God to lie. And so by two impossible things, God demonstrated where their hope was tethered, where their hope was found, in the promise, in the oath. Since it was impossible for God to lie, God made a promise, and if God made a promise and God cannot lie, he would keep that promise that cannot be changed. It's sure. It's certain. And to double down on that promise, God then makes an oath on top of that promise saying that he will keep it. Once again, it's impossible for God to lie, so it's impossible for God to break this oath. And God, by another certain thing, guaranteed what he told Abram. We go back and and look at God's interaction with Abraham and when God made that covenant with Abraham, we see that God took up both sides of that covenant. God promised on one side the things that he would do, the things that he would provide, and then God took up Abraham's side of the covenant and said, I will make sure that this takes place. I will keep up your side as well. And as we look at the life of Abraham, we see this constant Up and down, up and down. Where Abraham is faithful in doing what God has asked him to do for the most part. He's never perfect in everything that he does. But then he goes completely the opposite direction. He knows what God has said. He knows what God has promised. But yet he tries to take things into his own hands. And he goes somewhere else that he's not supposed to be. But God kept up his promise. And God kept up his oath. God held that covenant. Because God took up both sides. So despite what Abraham did or the circumstances that Abraham found himself in. God's promise and oath were sure. And he demonstrated that in Abraham. As we move forward into the New Testament where the Apostle Paul is writing to the Galatians. He he draws us out even further and, and points to the fact that. The heir of promise, the heir that was promised to Abraham was Christ himself. He says it wasn't heirs that the promise was made. It was an heir. And that heir was Christ. And now that in Christ, all who profess faith in Christ are now children of God. They are heirs of the promise with Abraham. So God desired to show this more convincingly. To the heirs of promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, his guarantee, and he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. The hope set before us is that promise in Christ. And he takes this and he he begins to show us that this hope is it's it's like an anchor. The hope is like an anchor. The, the anchor is that, that hope that we hold on to, that, that promise that we hold on to. 
It's an anchor of our soul. It it anchors us in reality. It anchors us in who we are and who God is. It's a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. This anchor, it doesn't stay with us, but it's tethered somewhere that cannot be moved. This hope is, is, is tossed into the place behind the curtain. And it it latches on to something that it cannot break away from. To Jesus. Where Jesus has gone as the forerunner on our behalf. Having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. This hope that we have that tethers us to reality and who we are and who God is. And what God has done and what God is going to do is tethered to Christ. That anchor, it it is connected to Christ who is the rock that will not let it break free. It's a sure thing. It's a certain thing. Our hope The anchor of our soul is locked on and tethered to Christ who has entered the place we have been promised. Christ has gone before to a place that we have been promised in Christ. He is that rock that our hope is anchored to. And our hope is built on what God has revealed to us, what God has showed us in his word. It's interesting that the word for soul in the Greek is psyche. Psyche. It's the inner self, our intellect and emotion. In the Bible, the soul is is the entity that thinks, feels, acts, and desires. Our hope, the ink of our soul, therefore, is not merely a strong emotion, but a strong reasoned conclusion of what God has revealed. It's specifically the intellect, not the emotion, that the writer has been appealing to. Without God's revelation, our hope would have nothing to tether to. Thus, we would be tossed to and fro like a ship in a storm with no anchor to hold it in place. The author goes on later in in chapter 13, in verse 6, and says this, So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? That's a confidence. It takes a lot of confidence to say that the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? That confidence is built upon a hope that is not a mere emotion but built off a reasoned conclusion of what God has revealed to us. Namely, his nature and character and what he has done in Christ. He goes on, he says, Remember your leaders, for those, those who spoke to you the word of God, consider their outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Pointing back to that certainty in who Christ is, the one that the anchor is secured on. Our hope is is resting on Christ. It is tethered to him. It cannot break free from that because Christ is certain. He goes on in verse 9. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. wrapped up in all that the author is saying is this idea in in the importance of us to know and understand the word of God and to continue to grow in that understanding and grow in maturity so that we can test and discern what God desires. And as we test and discern what God desires, it strengthens the hope that we have because we get to know God more and recognize more that that anchor that our hope is, is, is 
tethered to something that cannot break free and it will not go away and it will hold us steady in, in the strongest of storms so that no matter what happens, we can say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? There's a confidence that comes that as we get to know God more and when that hope gets strengthened through God's revelation to us, that no matter what life might throw at us, we can find contentment, as Paul said in Philippians 4.13. That we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That we can be content when it's good. We can have peace when things are good. We can be content and have peace when things are bad. Because our anchor is not tethered to something that can break free, but it's tethered to Christ. Our, our contentment is tethered in him. Our hope is tethered in him. So that no matter what may come... No matter how big the waves get, we will stay planted where we are. As we begin to wrap things up this morning, I, I want us to think on these things, and, and I want to leave you with a few things to think on this week. The first question would be, are you anchored in Christ? Is your hope anchored on him? Or have you placed your hope in something else? One of the good things that have come out of the last several years with the pandemic, with all that's going on in the world, the political mess that we find ourselves in today, is we've been shown that a lot of the things that our anchors have been tethered to are not secure. That when the storm really gets going, those things break. The anchor doesn't hold. The hope that we tossed out there and we thought, okay, this political candidate will fix things, broke. The job that you thought was secure that you put your hope in, broke. The relationships that you had around you that you thought would, would hold it all together broke. The reality is, is if, if our hope, if that hope, that anchor is not put on Christ, it will always break in the storm. That hope is strengthened as you study God's word. Let us not be a people a year from now who, who look back and maybe read this passage again and identify with those who should be mature but weren't. Who have heard scripture, who have gone to church, who have participated in, in a lot of good things but have never grown deeply into the knowledge of God through his word. Grow in your knowledge. Grow in your discernment. Test what is good. Test what is bad. And finally, be aware of false prophets. Might sound odd to throw that in there. But a part of that storm Part of that turmoil of information that we take in day in and day out is weeding out all the false prophets, all the false information. They come in different shapes and sizes. Maybe it's a 10 second reel on Facebook or YouTube. Maybe it's a podcast. Maybe it's a TV show. That's maybe telling you that certain things are going to happen at a certain time, but they never happen. It's a definition of a false prophet. How many predictions have you seen of the rapture lately? How many predictions have you seen of the end of the world in the last decade or two? And, and what happens is 
when, when we're not in the word, when we're not growing in discernment, when we see those things, it can shake us up. It might cause fear. It might cause a reaction. If we're not anchored in the word, if we're not anchored on Christ and in what God has revealed to us, we can be swayed to do things that aren't productive for the kingdom. We can get sucked into a reality that doesn't exist. Where is your anchor placed? Are you sure of where it's placed? How well do you know where it's placed? How much of God do you know? The more you come to realize and recognize who God is through the study of his word, his nature, his character, and all the things that he's done, the stronger that hope gets, the less wavering you will be, the more discerning you will be. And you won't be tossed to and fro, worrying about what's going to take place tomorrow or the next day or next November. Turn the false prophets off. Turn to the truth. Let God tell you what reality is. Let God work those things out. Anchor yourself on Christ and what he has done. Find true peace, true contentment. It's intellectual. It's emotional. We have to challenge our minds. Study deeply. And allow what's revealed to shape how we feel about the situations that we go through. It's not easy. Storms get scary. I'm reminded of Peter attempting to walk on water. He steps out of the boat and he's looking to Christ, but he gets distracted and he looks at the waves. He, he stops anchoring himself on Christ and focusing on Christ and who he is, and he focuses on all the problems around him, and what happens? He falls in the water. Don't get distracted by the storm. Place your anchor on Christ. Get to know him more and rest and trust that you cannot be moved when you are anchored to him. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Let's pray. Father, we just, we thank you. We thank you that you revealed yourself to us, that you have demonstrated yourself to us through your words, that we can have something tangible to know you. Father, help us to, to grow in maturity, that we would grow in our discernment of, of good and evil through the study of your word and, and knowing who you are so that we might anchor ourselves, place our hope on Christ, who has entered the place that you have promised through him. Father, we don't know what tomorrow brings, but let us not be distracted by those things. Let us not be distracted by the things that could happen. Let us not be distracted by the storms around us, whether there are circumstances, whether they're in our minds, whether they're in the culture around us. Let us not be distracted by those things and, 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 and move our anchor away from Christ, but let us hold tighter to him and to rest and be assured that no matter what may come, 
no matter what may come, you are our helper. That we will not fear. But we will walk confidently forward, growing in maturity and leading others to grow in maturity, not swayed by the thoughts of the day, but pressing forward, holding on to the truth that you revealed to us, anchored on Christ. And we give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We